My name is Mary Conquest. I'm your host for Safety Labs by Slice, the podcast where we explore the human side of safety to support safety professionals. We move past regulations and reportables to talk about the core skills of safety leadership, empathy, influence, trust, rapport. In other words, the soft skills that help you do the hard stuff. Hi there, welcome to Safety Labs by Slice. Today we're going to talk about trust in the workplace, not trust fall exercises or human pyramids that are built at company retreats, but integrated organizational trust and its companion, care. Our guest today wrote the number one Amazon best-selling book, Next Generation Safety Leadership, From Compliance to Care. And today we're going to talk about the ideas he shared in the book. Clive Lloyd is an Australian psychologist specializing in safety leadership and culture development. He was recently named among the top five global thought leaders and influencers on health and safety by Thinkers360. Clive is the co-owner and principal consultant with GIST Consulting and developer of the Care Factor program. For the past 20 years, Clive has assisted organizations to improve their safety performance by developing organizational trust and psychological safety. His experience includes working with companies in the mining, oil and gas, construction, and utilities industries. He's worked with organizations around the globe. And once again, the book is called Next Generation Safety Leadership from Compliance to Care. Clive joins us from Queensland, Australia. Welcome. Thank you, Mary, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, so let's dive right in because I have a, a lot of questions. Um, you call trust the currency of leadership. Can you explain what what you mean by that? Yeah, sure. So um, currency for me is um, something of value, something we can use to invest to get a particular return. And for me, um, over the years, I've discovered trust probably is the most powerful kind of currency for leaders to use to get return on that investment. Uh, and that's outside of safety. That That's in general. Uh, but if we look at that safety space, when I first got into it 20 years ago, it seemed to me the primary currency uh, was rules. You know, let, let's invest a lot in rules uh, with the outcome being hopefully compliance, you know, so, so people comply to these rules. And what I learned was it's that's not a particularly effective use of a, a currency. There are there are sort of unforeseen consequences often when we use rules as the currency. And again, what I've de- learned over the years is when we invest with trust, when we actually use that as our currency, not only do we get outcomes in terms of safety, return on investment, if you like, in terms of safety, but it's across the board. And what I've discovered, in fact, is you can't really do much at all without that. If we, if we aren't prepared to invest in developing trust, nothing works as well as it could. So it's, it's that simple thing for me is, Leaders, you, you've got a currency, at least a currency available to you. <laughs> Please use it um, rather than relying on other. I think rules still are used as a currency. To me, it's, it's like they're the cryptocurrency of safety, right? Uh, it's a dodgy investment. Um, possibly it can work sometimes in some areas if you get lucky. Um, it's not a very reliable currency to use. Um, trust is. It's a really reliable currency with really good returns on investment. That's all I meant, Mary, by, by trust as a currency. The skills that it takes to build trust are often referred to as soft yeah. skills, which when I hear that, it seems a little bit dismissive um, as though these skills are sort of optional or weak. But that's not the view you take. Can you can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. They they still are, and, and sort of marginally, frustratingly for me, referred to as soft skills. I get what people are saying. There's the hard skills, right? Like like learning engineering and that building bridges stuff. That is really really hard. I, I get that, and I'm glad people have those skills. I certainly don't. But w- what I've also learned over the years is without these allegedly soft skills. It is um, very, very challenging to bring people along on the journey, to create trust, in fact. In fact, if we really want to invest that currency of trust, these allegedly, again, soft skills are crucial. So uh, other people I've heard refer to them as crucial people skills, and they actually are. My background is clinical psychology. And, of course, 
once again, the, these particular skills of engagement, bringing people along, actually um, just gaining that full engagement, building relationship with people. They are absolutely crucial in the field of clinical psychology, of course, but they're crucial leadership skills to me too. If, if we don't have those skills, everything else becomes more challenging. And I don't think they're soft. Ironically, I think they're rather hard. I think they're hard in terms of difficult. And I think that's why maybe sometimes we do dismiss them. They're, they're not easy. They don't, they don't come intuitively to some people. They, like any other skill, can take a lot of work, a lot of practice, and a lot of development. And, hey, leaders are very, very busy people as a rule. And maybe, therefore, the preference is to be – you know, on what we see maybe more as the tangible skills that we can do things with to build that bridge or to to uh, invest in that. That's I, I get that. I, I get it's really important. But again, these these crucial people skills make everything else uh, better. And there's limits to what we can actually do if we don't, as leaders, have them. My belief. So yeah, I don't see them as soft skills at all. I think I do make that quite clear in the book. Uh, I get why people see them that way or frame them that way. But I think we would do well to start framing them you know, differently. Yeah, I tend to call them core skills yeah. versus as opposed to technical skills, hard skills being technical. But that's a, that's um, a better frame. That's my preference because they are core yeah. to pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah, um, um, especially effective leadership. So what is the relationship between trust and care? Yeah, great question. So, and we may discuss this later, Mary, but for me, care, just that, that notion of demonstrating care to our people. It's, it's what I describe in the book. The word the academics often use for it is benevolence. Academics, eh? Why use one word when you, uh, one syllable when you can use four? <laughs> but uh, I, I love the word, by the way, benevolence. But what it's hinting at there is not just caring. Uh, I'm of the belief, and I think I, I, I overall have a very kind view of human nature, I, I, I believe, but this notion of caring is actually not enough. I truly believe most leaders care about their teams to, to a more or less degree. What we found, though, is just caring is actually not enough. Um, it's great. It's a great start. We actually need to demonstrate care, and that's a different thing. Often when we're doing our leadership courses, I, I ask two questions back to back. Question one, put your hand up, I often say, if you believe that leaders within the company actually do care about their teams. Now, frequently, most, if not all, hands will go up. And I believe that is sincere. I believe that is genuine. I follow that up, though, with the question, put your hand up if you believe leaders in the company are really good at demonstrating care to their people. And it's interesting, Mary, hardly any hands go up, right? And so there is this gap, and it's, it's often shocking to leaders in the room when they see that in front of them. And we talk about the difference. And the big difference here, why this is important, is when I then do the same workshops at the crew level, the workforce level, and I ask them question one, that is, do you believe leaders care about their teams? Often, not many hands will go up. And think about it. How would they know? How would they, if we're not actually demonstrating care, how would they know? So, you know, a lot of what now, so the link between care and trust, and again, we may discuss this later. When we look at the research, and you know, this, this is intuitive to many people, but let's, let's go with the research. I'm a bit of a research driven creature. We look at uh, what constitutes, you know, what do leaders need to demonstrate consistently to create trust and sustain trust? And there are those three core factors integrity, ability or competence, and then again, what the academics call benevolence. Uh, care, if you like. And so it's that care factor that uh, we'll, we'll probably come to this is the most powerful in terms of overcoming mistrust. And think about it, if um, if we're aiming to bring people along on the journey to, to create that trust, how can we even begin to do that if our, uh, our workers perceive that we simply don't care about them? It's just not going to happen. And so while the other factors of building trust are really, really important, um, it is that one component, their care factor, that really tends to stand out, especially in terms of overcoming mistrust. So care in this context is just one of three aspects, three factors, if you will, of, of creating that trust. Yeah. And I mean, we, we're here now. Let's, let's talk about it now. You, you had mentioned the three components. Yeah. And they, you said they all. Sorry, can you repeat them again? Just yeah, for the absolutely. And so, the, ability, this is, by the way, integrity. Yeah, 
this is not my model. This comes from Maya et al. So it's probably one of the most um, widely cited models of organizational trust, perhaps outside of organizations, you know, with our families and friends. It may look a little bit different, although I think it probably does permeate all. But yeah, the three core factors are integrity. So in other words, doing what I said I would do. It infers things like honesty, reliability, and so forth. I think most people would understand intuitively um, that we need to demonstrate integrity. Um, it's not all about those core skills that we were just talking about, Mary. Ability or competence is in there. In other words, as leaders, we need to demonstrate that we are good at you know, what we're supposed to be good at. It doesn't mean we're good at everything. Uh, nobody is. But we do need to demonstrate to our people that we're good at what we're supposed to be good at. Then again, that third factor is benevolence, demonstrated care. Now, we do need all three. For example, um, I might really care about my people and demonstrate that. I may even demonstrate integrity. But if my people perceive I'm no good at all at my job, I'm really incompetent at my job, it's going to be really challenging to create and sustain. Now, equally, I can be really good at my job, highly competent, and even demonstrate integrity. But if my workers perceive that I simply don't care about them, once again, it, it's going to be incredibly challenging to build and sustain trust. Now, again, sort of all three are important, but different ones stand out as more powerful depending on the situation. Yeah. So you had talked about there's one that stands out in terms of creating trust, and then there's one that stands out in terms of overcoming mistrust. Yeah, that's right. And again, not moving away from the fact that we do need to demonstrate all three, but when we look at the regression models, to create trust in the first place uh, relies a lot more perhaps on that integrity piece. And again, I think people would understand that intuitively. If we get a sense that somebody is lacking in integrity, and we, we click on this stuff really quickly sometimes intuitively. If somebody is lacking in integrity, they're not honest, they're not genuine, they're not sincere, they don't follow through on promises. Again, really challenging to create that trust in the first place. So integrity does stand out there. What is interesting, and I, I found this research really interesting quite a number of years ago, to overcome mistrust, which is a different thing, um, it's that care factor, that benevolence factor that really stands out. But again, if you think about it, it does make sense. Um, if there is existing mistrust amongst the team, we still get this strong sense that leaders simply don't care about us. It's going to be incredibly challenging to overcome that mistrust. So why did we call our, our flagship program the Care Factor? Well, because of that. That's the space that we often end up working in, is actually overcoming pockets of mistrust. By the way, it's always easier to create trust in the first place than it is to overcome any existing mistrust. But we, we've learned we cannot even hope to do that unless we do demonstrate care. There's a, um, a saying, I think, right at the beginning of my book, trust arrives on foot but leaves on horseback. Yeah. So in, in other words, it can take quite a while to build. Um, but yeah, it, it can go very, very quickly. And uh, to overcome that, we have to put all of our attention on making sure the workers understand that we, we actually do care. And in fact, we, we can actually demonstrate that. Two things occurred to me while you were talking is that you almost never, I'm sure, start with a blank slate, no. right? I mean, organizations don't, especially by the time they're they're hiring you, right? There's something going on. But the other thing you said was pockets of mistrust, which was illustrates that it's not a blanket, something that I hadn't really thought about before. It's not a blanket thing like everybody trusts or everybody mistrusts. No. Sometimes you can have a 70% good trusting, but maybe there's one team That's or right. that sort of thing. So yeah. And this is what complicates this. Yeah, this. that's that's a little more hopeful. It, it is. It is. And uh, it can go the other way too because it, it can hold some organizations back. But we, we often talk about culture, for example, as this blanket thing. Um, and, and organizations often bring us in and their request to us is, Clive, we want to change the culture. And I, I, already I'm starting to think, oh, gosh, here we go. And they often ask, how long will it change, Clive, to, you know, to move from a, a level two culture to a level four culture? And I think, I don't know, what, 10 years? Are, there, are, there are too many variables there, right? And it's, it's largely because we don't have one culture. We, we always talk in terms of the ba culture. We don't have one culture. Uh, I would suggest strongly that every team, to a degree, 
has its culture. And it may well be that overall the, the culture exists at a, you know, a level three or something like that, but there will be these pockets that maybe one or two pockets up at level four, another pocket or two down at level two. Despite the fact that on the website the values are the same throughout, the policies and procedures, all of that stuff is the same everywhere you look, what does that generally come down to? It generally comes down to leadership, and in this case, local leadership. That particular leader, for whatever reason, has been able to create the climate where things like trust and psychological safety can thrive, whereas quite simply other leaders have not. And again, I'm not in the business of blaming leaders. Uh, as I wrote also in the book, we can blame or we can learn. That you know, very popular mantra right now. I extend that to leadership. We can blame or we can learn, but let's learn um, and so forth. So absent, this is very, very variable uh, within one organization. It's not one thing. It's not one culture. And we, we need to attend to that. So you were just, just now talking about levels. And I, I do want to zoom out again uh, at to the organizational level. Uh, in the book, you described five levels of organizational functioning in, in the evolution or the movement from compliance to care. Yeah. So if it's all right with you, I'd like to just quickly go through them yeah. and, and have you explain briefly what you mean by each. Yeah, great. And so apathetic is the first apathetic. one. So before I get into the, the various stages, let me just say a couple of things. First up, to quote the famous statistician George Box, he once said, um, let me think of a quote. Um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I, I, I think most sort of safety culture development tools would fall into that category, including the one I'm using. And the one I, I've been using now for many years effectively is, is Professor Patrick Hudson's model of cultural maturity. But that's 20 odd years old now. And why I think it's useful still is because when I work with organizations, I believe in meeting people where they are. Uh, my own preference is not really to talk about safety culture because uh, I, I don't think that's really a thing, uh, even though I've just wrote a book about it, right? Uh, in other words, um, I believe – I certainly believe in culture and I believe if you've got a, a maturing culture, well, safety culture would sit as, as a, a function of that, if you like. With uh, Hudson's model, I always found it useful for organizations, many of whom use that anyway, so let me meet them where they are. It was useful for helping them to work out where they currently sit to some degree. And I, I think that is useful. If we can get a bit of a, an idea about where we currently sit, possibly even um, with regard to where other similar organizations or similar industries sit, that can be useful. More to the point, if we know where we currently are, that can help us to, to really work out quite clearly what we need to do to progress, what we need to do. And so I found it really useful. Uh, Hudson's model, again, that 20 something years old, it didn't include many of the things that we do now to work with clients. Things like psychological safety, for example, was not part of that original model. Um, other aspects, uh, Hudson's original model had those five stages drawn as very discrete entities. That is, you're either in one of those boxes, um, or you're not. And to, in my experience, it's not actually like that. Uh, there might be elements of the organization that sit, they straddle maybe a few of those different areas. Um, and so forth. so for me, it was I, I just made some tweaks to that model. I drew it as not just five discrete boxes, but as a journey, because we can go backwards too, and we might come to that. Um, and so there was other things like uh, trust. Trust was part of Hudson's model. He did concede that increasing levels of trust tended to be associated with more mature organizations, but he didn't really sort of go into any depth on that, whereas for me, it's absolutely core. So there were a few things like that. So I made a few changes for the book. And so similarly, though, to, to Patrick Hudson, those apathetic, um, let's start with that, really in those cultures, um, safety is just oh, it's something we've got to do, right? The damn regulators make us do that. Um, there's no great wish to have it there. Uh, it's like, you know, we work in a dangerous company, incidents happen, and there's a resignation to that. They, It's really about avoiding punishment. So managers avoiding punishment from the regulators, for example. Uh, for the workforce, it's more about avoiding punishment from the managers and so forth. So it's based purely on putting the tick in the box, avoiding trouble, staying out of trouble. Now, unfortunately, that will first up, quite naturally, they hurt way more people, particularly really serious injuries. 
But um, there's a lot of fear amongst the workforce because incidents are generally seen purely as the fault of the workers. You know, they are stupid. I've heard that said. They are stupid. They don't follow procedure. They don't speak up. They take shortcuts. So intrinsically there, it's about blaming the workforce. Now, where you have blame, high levels of blame, you have high levels of fear and wishing to avoid punishment. So secrets are kept from management. There's us versus them and secrets are kept. As I also write in the book, we can't fix a secret. Uh, we certainly can't fix. So apathetic looks like that. Now, reactive, um, safety is a priority. Um, so we've moved a bit there. The trouble is it's often more of a priority after an incident. That's when we get the action, right? And, and still, it, it tends to come back to the workforce. They might start employing some you know, BBS tools and, and things like that. We're, we're effectively, it's still blame-based safety, BBS sort of thing. So we still tend to blame the workers uh, if we progress. Uh, involving then, and as the name suggests, now we've made a bit of a shift. We're now bringing our people in. We understand they can contribute. In fact, their contribution um, as we mature, becomes more and more valuable. We realize they are effectively the experts in the jobs that they do. They understand the nuances of the work, where the new policy fits perfectly, and sometimes where they have to adapt it just to get the job done. And there's that realization that if we bring them in, if we involve the workforce, then our systems work better, our procedures work better. And just quietly, of course, as we bring in the workforce, what we're also increasing there are levels of trust. So fear starts to drop and trust starts to come up. Now, when my whole team starts to feel that level of trust, that's what we would refer to as that psychological safety. So we're starting that process of involving. Now, a proactive, of course, that has just become just what we do. Um, we see that incidents happen because of a whole range of um, variables, including leadership decisions, including management decisions. The workforce then are fully involved in safety uh, right across the board. Ultimately, we get to uh, what we call the integrated, and it's, it's integrated because safety is now not a separate thing. We don't view safety as this separate entity. It's just how we do work. And for me, I love to hear this. The, the level five industries tend to not even talk about safety very much. Um, whereas in the lower realm, it's safety. So we create this whole separate world about safety. We have the safety team who hold the workforce to account uh, and so forth. Level five, uh, that's rare. We just don't, we talk about doing work well and reliably with the full um, and welcome collaboration from the workforce. Trust is very high. Fear of speaking up, fear of admitting mistake is essentially gone. The us versus them is largely replaced by we. And, of course, because of that, because we've got the full involvement of the workforce, we tend to identify more risks, more hazards very proactively. If we do that, we can manage and mitigate more risks. And, of course, naturally this flows to they tend to have way less than their fair share of incidents, especially the serious ones. So that's roughly the progression. Now, for me, the things that stand out the most there as we mature, we increasingly bring the workforce in. We listen to them. We respond to them. People are now involved. And the other big thing for me, of course, is the elevating, the ongoing elevating aspects of trust and psychological safety. So that's in a very nutshell version, Mary, the, the progression as I see it. And I think it's important you mentioned this to to say that it's not like a, a predetermined pathway that that goes from this step to this step or that's even you know that has okay we've been here for five years now <laughs> we automatically move up yeah. you said that you can move backwards as well and and different teams can be or different areas perhaps of an organization can be different but I'm curious about one thing let's whether you're moving f sort of forwards or backwards or trust going up or down yeah. do organizations ever sort of skip like <laughs> would they go from reactive skip over involvement and then become proactive or or is it kind of is it more like an evolution a maturity yeah look it doesn't have to be perfectly linear it doesn't have to be at all in fact let's just say i'm at so my company is at level two and we have aspirations of course to progress my, my thought would be why would you plan to progress to level three 
why would you not seek to put into place the, the systems required and so forth to actually start at least start the journey to be at level four? And so I believe that is possible to do. In reality, it does tend to be a bit more linear than that. For example, if I'm at level two, which is not involving at all, and I want to be at level four, which involves a great degree of involving our people, there is still, of course, that necessity to start that process. And the workforce, for example, might be a little reticent. They might be kind of hesitant to get too involved because last time they did get involved, they were punished for it. So, you know, it, it still tends in reality to progress in that way. But my, my suggestion to companies that we work with is let's plan for, uh, r- rather than arduously going through two, three to four, let's look at what we can set up now to, to, to actually be up there. But in reality, it tends to be, um, yeah, moving through those areas for various reasons. Um, now, when we go back, backwards, it, it's often not linear at all in that. And this is interesting, Mary, because uh, the, the journey upwards tends to be linear. I have seen organizations who maybe have been at level four, at least most of their, their teams would be at level four. They can go right back to level two very, very quickly. All it takes is one executive for example, one change at the executive level who actually undoes very quickly. Again, trust arrives on foot but leaves on horseback and something like that can cause an instant regression. Uh, The other classic, of course, in the safety field is we can be existing quite nicely at level three, maybe level four, and then we can regress to level two, especially after an incident, particularly a serious incident. I tend to gauge more than anything where a company is sitting, largely based on how they respond after an incident, because it is all too easy, in fact, almost automatic to regress and to, to go straight back down to level two. So, yeah, it's, it doesn't have to be linear on the way up. It does tend to work out that way in the real world. Moving backwards, often not linear at all. There's often a big jump there. Unfortunately. And I mean, you're looking at things through the lens of trust. So it makes sense that after a serious incident, trust, everyone feels vulnerable after a serious incident. And so trust would be at risk at that time, right? Especially depending on how that was. I'd like to shift a little bit. Sorry, Mary. Yes. (laughs) We've got a bit of a delay, folks. Uh, So. Yeah. (laughs) I wanted to shift actually and talk a little bit about behaviorism. So in the book, you describe it as extremely common. You say that while the field of psychology has moved on from this approach, you don't find that the field of management has moved on from the approach. And do you think that's still the case? And, and, you know, what's wrong with behaviorism? And yeah, what what do you see when you get out there? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, this is a big topic. I could well get hate mail from this. I often get trolled on LinkedIn um, when I even dare um, suggest that there may be better ways. Look, let me let me put it this way. As, as psychologists, particularly when we're trained in, in the clinical aspects of psychology, we, of course, go through all the various modalities that uh, are available and have been available in psychology over the years. Um, right back, if you will, to, to Freudian psychology, the psychodynamic approach, right up to really, really modern things like EMDR and so forth. So what we learned, uh, I went through uni, by the way, in the 90s, the early 90s. Not <laughs> been doing this a long time, Mary. And even then, even back in the 90s, behaviorism was largely dead. Um, and there are reasons for that. And behaviorism, again, was purely based on only studying observable behaviors. People were not interested in Skinner himself, the the father of behaviorism, openly stated, not remotely interested in cognitions and especially those emotions, not interested. All we want to do is look at observable behaviors and seek to change those through conditioning, usually based on reward and punishment mentality. And so first up, you know, just hearing that, I could understand why maybe you know, psychology had moved on from that. You know, the, the very things that tend to drive behaviors are cognitions and emotions. And behaviorism just says, not interested. And so to me, it was, a, I mean, behaviorism never really worked with humans. It, it, it barely works when you're training your dog, right? If you've got a really smart dog, 
uh, we, we <laughs> we've got a we've, we've got a kelpie, right? Um, an Australian sheepdog, essentially. They are as smart as a whip, sharp as a whip, and even some behave. They see through it. They, they see through it. They're just interested in getting the reward. And if they can get away with the re- having the reward without going through the behaviour, they'll do it. And that's dogs. And most of the research in behaviourism was done on dogs and pigeons. Humans are just a tad more complex than that. So behaviourism for me was out. Most um, psychologists, in fact, all psychologists that I know would not choose to use behaviorism as a modality of choice. They, they just would not because we've evolved. We've moved past that, but we've got much better ways to look at that. But we still use it in safety in the form of BBS, behavior-based safety. BBS is based on behaviorism. And so, again, what we're missing in BBS is what actually drives those behaviors in the first place. And unfortunately, BBS lent itself to uh, a lot of those sort of rules. If you follow the rules, you know, you get rewarded. Um, if you don't, well, you get punished. And so all we learn to do as human beings is we'll just avoid the punishment, but we just don't talk about it. We just won't admit a mistake. Um, or when we did sort of move away from the policy, we just don't let management know that. So it's really fixing nothing. It's also the, again, the unfortunate consequences. Don't get me wrong, well intended. I don't mean to attack people who run behavior based safety things as, as I, I believe most companies that brought BBS in did so with a good intent. I really believe that. But look at the unintended consequences, right? Um, still to this day, what we'll do is when our people have been good and listen to the language here, right? You can't get away from this. When people have been good, done the right thing. Okay, reward that. And let's. what does this look like in safety, right? We've been that magical a million hours LTI free. See that on LinkedIn every day, right? There's those self-congratulatory posts. We've got a million hours LTI free. What do we do? Well, reward, maybe a cash bonus for that. And what does that literally do? It incentivizes non-reporting. It's an unintended consequence. Plus, think about it, Mary. When we talk about behavior-based safety, Whose behavior are we talking about? It's not the board's behavior. It's not the SLT's behavior. It's the workforce behavior. You cannot hold that position effectively without coming to the conclusion that why do we have incidents? Because of them, because of the workforce. And again, think culturally. What we're doing is blaming the workforce. You can only have that at level one and two. And it's, I have found over the years, it's incredibly challenging for companies to move from a level two to level three with BBS. Because it, even with the best of intent, it comes back to a blame the worker approach. So for all of those and many more reasons, Mary, yeah, I'm not a big advocate for BBS. I believe it's well intended, but I do get a lot of, um, <laughs> not hate mail, but I do get a lot of very angry people when I actually even dare to suggest that they may be better ways. Most of them just happen to run BBS consultancies, but anyway. Well, we're not trying to court uh, controversy no. here, but I, I am interested. Do you, over the course of your career, have you seen a change in, in the field of management? So you say yeah. some people haven't caught up, but ha- has that changed? I believe so, Mary. I, I believe it is changing. I believe it's been becoming increasingly untenable to take that old behavior-based pointy finger approach. The the punishment and reward mentality, I believe, is changing because awareness is changing. There's ample research now to demonstrate that things like trust and psychological safety are not just nice-to-haves. They're not just these esoteric concepts. Um, Project Aristotle demonstrated that psychological safety, for example, is the number one predictor of high-performing teams. Um, I'm yet to find in the safety field a stronger predictor of safety performance than trust and psychological safety. So there is, if for no other reason that you know the bottom line will improve, I think there's this movement away from the old command control approach, if you will. Um, I think command control leadership is, is well past its use by date, and I do see that changing. It... Um, Again, many large companies, many large corporations, they're not that agile. And if that's the way they've been taught to lead and that is part of their, indeed, culture, 
it's slow to change, but I believe um, there is quite a significant shift going on right now. In the safety field, that is definitely happening. Um, as we talk about the new view of safety, which most people now are familiar with, um, that I believe has gained a significant momentum, is, is making changes. Again, with the new view, there is the danger that there are so many of these different models, a bit like psychology, right? Um, in psychology, we've got yeah, behaviorism, cognitive psychology, humanistic psychology, positive psych, all these different mo models that we can use. And we tend to be eclectic in our approach, drawing from what we believe is best. In safety, what have you got? You got safety too. You got safety differently. You got hop. You got resilience engineering. And what I find is, for the most part, safety leaders out there don't really care what you call it. They just want to know what's going to help. And so, for me, I tend in my workshops, in my training, I tend not to avoid talking about the models because um, it's not the model. And there's ample research around that. But what is central to the new view models really is bringing our people in, engaging our people, building trust, and. You know, you can have the best of intent. You want to, you know, just change to doing safety too or safety differently. That will only work if you have first built, well, overcome the mistrust of the workforce. Uh, otherwise, regardless of its merit, any new change, the workforce are just going to sit there saying, uh, here we go again. So trust is central. But to me, there's definitely a shift on here. I think there's a common perception that leaders in, I say dysfunctional organizations, what organizations that are not high on trust, let's say, yeah. there's a perception that the leaders don't want to invest in trust. But you've stated that when they, when they fail to invest in trust, it's usually not... <laughs> It's not usually because they don't want to. Yeah. It's because they don't know how to. They don't know how to cultivate it. You know, tell me more about that. And then let's talk a bit about how leaders, how listeners can start to work on building trust. Yeah. Look, uh, and that is, that is my experience over the last 20 years. I really believe most leaders, uh, it's not that they don't want trust or are, are against trust. I don't think anybody is when they're being rational. They, they see it as a nice to have. But again, they've got their own demands. This is why I, I'm, I'm not about blaming leaders. They've got their own demands. They've got their own KPIs. And for them, again, if we go back to that language that you raised at the start, Mary, these soft skills, sure, nice. They would be really nice to have. And we have these KPIs and we need to deliver. And this, therefore, is important. And it's, it's this whole notion of we've only got so much time. We've only got so many resources. Um, sure, if we can build trust in the meantime, do it. But I also need this, 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 and this doing. And it's often only when um, we've gone through some of the research with our clients to talk about that this, 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 and this are actually incredibly assisted by um, having a culture that's high on trust and psychological safety. Everything works better. Pointing out that the number one predictor of psychological uh, of, of um, high performing teams is psychological safety. And so it's, it's making the case for change. And to be fair, they need that. You know, trust is not going to be necessarily high on their agenda if they feel it's not going to impact the bottom line. And so I believe it's not that they don't want it. I think most of them do. But then there's the, the notion, how do we do that? And I actually think it's just seen as difficult. And uh, maybe related to if we frame what we're talking about here as soft skills. Well, you know, th th those are esoteric kind of, they're soft, they're not very tangible. And so it's, they, they actually can't imagine that this can be very easy to do. And there's the irony. Right? It's hard. <laughs> um, not soft. And so <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I, I honestly believe most companies that, yeah, yeah, it's all great. We want that. We want a trusting team, but gee, how do we do that? How do we get our, t our leaders to create? It seems to be incredibly challenging, arduous, perhaps a very long journey. And those facts alone are enough for, for many leaders to say, look, we'll come back to that. Before we get into some ways, specific ways to talk about building trust, I do want to ask you about some ways that safety leaders might inadvertently be undermining trust. Yeah. Can you think of a few examples? Yeah, and I like the fact, Mary, that you've got that word inadvertently there, again, because often what the things they are doing are very well intended, but again, often with unintended consequences and unintended negative consequences. Let me rattle through a few. 
because there's a lot. <laughs> uh, for example, a goal of zero harm, a goal of zero harm, it would make sense, right, philosophically. I mean, let's face it, you, we don't want a goal of uh, a little bit of harm. <laughs> let's just have a little bit of harm. Let's just hurt three people. How about Nigel, Philip, and Terry? It, that makes no sense at all. But the thing is, psychologically, a goal of zero harm, we know from the research, is actually quite harmful. It's a binary goal. It's zero or it's not zero. Now, unfortunately, again, the unintended consequence is some organizations have become a little bit overzealous and then, for example, they become intolerant of incidents, intolerant. Now, of course, when that happens, we send messages out and the message often received by the workforce is just keep quiet. And so we find reporting tends to go underground. Now, again, we can't fix a secret. Well intended. And again, there's, there's some fairly current research um, from 2018. Uh, I think it's called the zero paradox now that found that organizations with that zero goal tend to have more uh, life changing incidents and fatalities, not less more. And that is often uh, a function of the fact that reporting goes down. We tend to be reluctant to re you know, report incidents or report near misses. So again, really well intended, but just doesn't tend to work out. Uh, over here in the mining industry, for example, organizations proudly display these things on their shirts, you know, zero harm, zero incidents. And I was at a site recently, they had beyond zero Think what beyond zero? What are you going to reincarnate people now? <laughs> it, it, it all gets a little bit stuck. negative. <laughs> negative numbers. <laughs> negative numbers. We're going to start reincarnating people, and go, it's gotten a little bit silly. And so these are what I would refer to often in organisations as the safety platitudes, often maybe meant with sincerity, but they they're, they're viewed by the workforce as platitudes. Um, the other big ones, of course. Um, Safety is our number one priority. Well, no, it's not. Um, or it is until it isn't. You know, <laughs> priorities change and the workforce know this. Uh, here's a recent case study, a, a company I was working with. They'd had a lost time injury uh, and quite a nasty one. But what they did, they brought this fella back who'd been injured. And they brought him back on light duties. Now, again, sometimes that works for both parties. It can be good to get people back to work and so forth. On this occasion, it was done purely for metrics. In other words, so it did not count as a lost time injury because, hey, zero harm, right? You know, we don't want to spoil that. So that's happened. Everybody knows that's happened. And then a, uh, the general manager just days after this was doing a state of the nation address. And uh, first words out of his mouth to his the, the workforce was, I just wish to remind everybody that your safety is our highest priority. And I, I, you could hear a pin drop. I know in their heads they're thinking, yeah, right. And But think about the damage that is doing. Well intended, sounds nice, but what's increasing here is cynicism. What's decreasing is integrity and trust. So in other words, we're actually just kneecapping the culture from doing these well intended things. Um I don't know how long we've got. I've got a whole list of these. Things like safety walks, Mary, uh, which most companies do. Now, unfortunately, the, the way they do their safety walks is been sort of polluted by BBS, if you will. But have, so their idea of the safety walk is all managers, and they usually have KPIs around this, by the way. They'll don the hard hat. They'll put the high-vis vest on, and they're out there with a the pad and a pen, and they're they're looking for bad stuff, right? They're looking for violations and um, so first up, shouldn't be called a safety walk, should be called an unsafety walk because let's face it, that's what they're looking for. Um, now, the KPI often is like managers need to do eight safety walks a month, effectively two a week. Now, very few of these leaders enjoy doing them for obvious reasons. They're not pleasant. So what they tend to do is leave it to the end of the month, right? And then you get these swarms of leaders across sites all looking for bad stuff and it's not like the workforce don't know they're coming because they do this every month. And so their supervisors will be saying, they'll be out soon, you know, go and have a tidy up. So leaders, number one, they're not seeing things as they actually are anyway. Uh, and by the way, where there's fear, you get bad data. It's just a truism. And so think about that. What is that doing for trust? They're out there looking for bad stuff. Um, that's not helping trust. That's creating fear. 
they're not seeing things as they really are anyway because people have already tied it up. Um, it's That's what I would refer to effectively as safety clutter. But we, we keep doing it. And what we're doing is we're not helping. Now, all I say to the leaders is, if you really believe you need a KPI around this, and by the way, you don't. We create. If you really want to wreck safety quickly, just have lots of KPIs on it. Um, how about this? Rather than um, a KPI of these alleged safety walks, how about this is a KPI? I said this to one leader. KPI, what percentage of your people's children's names do you know? And let's say that was 40%. What would that also infer that I've been doing? Well, I've been out there. I've been having conversations, God forbid, about not even work or safety, just conversations, building relationships, building trust. Now, before you, people have a go at me, I, I know it probably wouldn't work in practice because you get some leaders going out, right, you, what are your kids' names? Got them. What are your kids' names? Got them. I, I know that would happen. But the spirit of what I'm saying remains true. Just go for a walk. You, know, you don't need to label it. Just go for a walk. And while you're out walking, engage in what I often call and what Ed Shine called humble inquiry. That is, what is it you need from us to do your job well and safely? Um, tell me about that new policy. Where does it fit for you? Where maybe have we had to adapt it just, just to get the job done? and so forth. Those will build relationships, they'll create trust and actually get us useful data. So there's much that is done um, in the safety field in the name of safety and well-intended that actually has very serious unintended consequences that loses trust, builds fear and just really gets in the way. And so part of my role, part of our role uh, as a company is to help organisations make that shift from you know, the old BBS fear-based approach, punishment, reward mentality, to genuine engagements, to bringing the workforce in, collaborating, and, and it just makes all the difference in the world. I think when we talk about intention to you, there's something you said at the very beginning about the message people get, yeah. which reminds me that there can be a gap between what you say the words that are said and the message that is received. Absolutely. And I think that's what you're talking about. Absolutely. And uh, again, that's a whole other realm of, of the safety field, um, whether it's work as imagined and work as done that most people would be familiar with. But you're right, the message as imagined and the message as received, there is often a very good gap. So let's talk about building trust then. Let's, let's, uh, get into something uh, practical. And can you talk about a few ways that listeners can go to work today and and just start, make a start at investing in trust? Yeah. And look, I've already touched on one in that last story. Um, and that is to, to get out there, N not in a formalized KPI way, but just that, that visible felt leadership that is a bit of a cliche. Um, however, there are some downsides sometimes to visible felt leadership in that it depends when we're visible, what are people seeing? And when they're feeling, that's the felt part, what are they feeling? So it's all right to have visible felt leadership. You've got to wonder what they're feeling, right? And if I'm walking around with a KPI and a pointed finger, what they're feeling is fear and resentment. That's not effective. What we need them to feel from the visible felt leadership is trust, genuine care, engagement. So that's a different approach from leadership. Put your KPIs away. Just get out there, engage in humble inquiry. So what works in this, um, I, I guess, let, let me flip it around. When I ask the workforce themselves, which we always do, what would be an indicator that your leader actually demonstrates care? What would be an example of that? I think that's a really valuable question. Now, some of them, you know, they give me numerous things. By far, though, Mary, the most common response I get is a simple one. And they say... I know they care because they listen to us. They listen to us. Now, of course, that does infer that once again, I have been out there. Maybe I've been engaging in that humble inquiry. Uh, not only that, I demonstrate that I have listened by coming back to them. If Even if there's something that they think would be a good idea that for whatever reason I cannot deliver upon, I will still go back and explain my challenges around doing that. And so just that whole notion of either bringing people in or going out to them 
is, is a really important thing. Uh, for my own team, we do this as a company, but I recommend other organizations do this, is to structurally embed within the way that we do work an opportunity to bring their people in uh, and to share what we often call the brutal facts. That's from a tool called the Stockdale Paradox. But in other words, just to share for them their current challenges. Um, and then, of course, very importantly, we, we listen to those. We don't judge them. We don't have to agree nor disagree. We just listen. And then we work out together with these challenges what we can control, uh, what we can influence, and we come up together with an action plan to resolve those challenges. Now, those should not be hit and miss um, occurrences. When we structurally embed those opportunities into the way that we do work, we are teaching our teams some very, very important things. Number one, um, our voices are important. Our voices are important to leadership. Secondly, it is safe to share bad news or allegedly bad news. That's really the essence of psychological safety. When the workforce realize that they can do that without fear of negative consequence, we start, of course, in quite a strong way to build trust, maybe even start overcoming mistrust because we're demonstrating care. Um, before you know it, great things are happening here too because, as I mentioned before, we can't fix a secret. Well, maybe now there's no real need to keep secrets. Everything's out there on the table. And when that happens, we pick up on more challenges. We, could, we pick up on what we call the pain points. And if there's one very valuable thing to do in safety as a proactive measure, it's to hear from people about their pain points. And that is, it might just be that a job is overly arduous. It seems uncomfortable, clunky, doesn't seem to work very well. Those often are predictors of incidents that may happen down the track. If we can get our people to start talking about the pain points, working out what we can control and influence, that, I've learned, can really offset a lot of potential damage later on, not just physical damage, but psychological damage, morale, and all of those things. So those are really um, some of the, the basic things that we can do. The language that we use, of course, um, I talk a lot in the book about our use of language, making it very intentional, very conscious language. There's a lot of language in safety that is really unhelpful, right? And I discovered this 20 years ago when I first started. Um, and how I started, by the way, they brought me in to do counseling after a fatality. Um, and so, you know, they brought me in to do this very humanistic work. And I couldn't believe it. As I was doing that, all these other processes had started by the companies. Things like um, investigations, looking for violators, looking for offenders, breaches of golden rules, and safety officers. And again, I remember thinking at the time, where else in the organization do we use that language? You know, but we use it in safety. I mean, think about it. Who doesn't love being investigated by an officer, right? <laughs> um, and <laughs> we, we need to move, change our language, get rid of that stuff. There's, there's a chapter in the book uh, about moving away from that language and using more proactive, more conscious, more trust-building language. So, again, inadvertently, often just through the words that we use. And we're often taught to use those those phrases in safety. That's another thing leaders inadvertently can do to actually break trust. There's a few, Mary. There's, yeah. So one that I'm interested in, because um, we were talking about, we're talking about developing relationships and trust. And one way to do that is to converse. And one way to converse is to ask questions. But you talk about assumptive questions. Yeah. And I think that's a, a good thing to, to pull out. Yeah, look, I, I think, by the way, I, I believe leaders, a, a leader's best friend are questions, not just leaders, incidentally, I think parents, um, adolescent children, especially, but parents, partners, friends, questions are really powerful. From a brain perspective, there's, for, for various reasons, we tend to steer people's attention by the types of questions that we ask. They tend to switch our conscious brain on. So we need to be mindful of that. For example, assumptive questions tend to have an agenda. They, they tend to start with things like, look, don't you agree that, <laughs> in other words, if you don't agree, there's something probably wrong with you <laughs> and so forth. And again, people often ask these questions totally innocently, not realizing the impact of those questions and so forth. Yeah. Don't you agree that that would be a good idea? Um, 
there's it's almost a compulsion to to agree otherwise oh geez i'm I'm wrong here uh and so forth so we need to watch these assumptive questions uh, they're more manipulative ones uh we can ask reasonable assumptive questions like uh, here's one from a facilitator's point of view i often hear rookie facilitators at the end of a section say right are there any questions for example now you know, a nice, easy response from the, from the audience quite is, well, no. <laughs> and again, where you can ask useful or something questions might be more along the lines of, okay, what questions do you have? All right, so I am making an assumption that there are questions out there. So things like that can make a difference. I do, though, talk in the book about the difference between above-the-line questions and below-the-line questions, or to use psychological jargon, internally versus externally locused questions. So safety, uh, particularly with a BBS mindset, tend, tended at least historically to have questions like, after an incident, who's to blame? Why did they do that? They are blame-based questions, as opposed to, say, the, the, the new view questions would be more along the lines of what happened, takes the person out of that. What are we going to learn from this? What will we do differently as a result? And so by shifting the questions that we use, we can shift the focus of, well, we can either fall into blaming or learning. And again, we can blame or we can learn. We don't get to do both. A lot of that depends on how we actually operate with those questions. And it's all too easy after an incident to fall into that reflexively. Why did they do that? This is one I hear a lot, Mary, from leaders after an incident. What were they thinking? (laughs) What were they thinking? Uh, and again, the inference there is either they weren't or they were thinking the wrong thing. Somehow they are bad. You cannot ask questions like that without really digging in with that blame-based mentality, moving away from that questions that actually serve us and serve learning. What happened? Why did it make sense to do that? Even if the, the behavior was seemingly errant or mistaken, it would have made sense And what I know is if we don't understand why it made sense for that person to take the shortcut, it assuredly will make sense for somebody else to do exactly the same thing later on. Let's understand why it made sense. So different questions get us to different answers. I often say to leaders, if you're not getting the answers you want from your people, don't blame them for that ask better questions. We're coming up on the end of some t- of our time here, but I, there are a few questions that I like to ask all my guests. Sure. So this one I'm going to have to adapt for you a little bit. Okay. So normally I ask what would you, what kind of soft slash core skill training would you recommend for tomorrow's safety professionals? And I'm going to guess that you would say trust and caring. <laughs> yeah, I would. So maybe instead I'll ask you how, yeah, how would you approach sort of teaching these skills to future safety leaders? Yeah, great question. And look, if you were to pin me down for one core skill, I would get leaders to invest in, and there's the currency of trust again, or cu- currency of leadership, it would be listening. Uh, as a rule, we're not very good at it. Um, as many have said, we listen to respond rather than listening to understand. Um, Active listening is a core skill in itself. And to me, it's one of the most powerful ones. Um, What we do with uh, organizations, with leaders to help them is raise their own self-awareness before they start looking at other people, before we get them to lift their own awareness. For example, we, we bring in a tool called transactional analysis where we get them to look and become increasingly aware of the psychological masks that they wear. Now, this is a bit deep. I won't go into too much depth there. It could take a long time. But we all wear psychological masks to a degree, and that is to to fit in, to reduce anxiety in certain settings. But we we go through a few masks that we all develop over time. We call these parent, adult, and child masks. From It's a theory in psychology called transactional analysis. And when I wear my parent mask, For various reasons, that literally influences the words that come out of my mouth as well as my thinking. If I'm wearing that parental mask, I will tend to be much more pointy finger in my leadership approach. 
I will tend to be us versus them. I will have put downs in my language. Um, when I wear my child mask, I will be um, avoidant. I don't want conflict. I don't want to engage in challenge or difficult conversations. I wish to avoid like that and leave all that uncomfortable stuff to the big people, if you like. And this is what we call operating in our adult ego state, authentic, assertive, here and now. And so we raise our leader's awareness by first up checking in which masks do we wear most frequently at work? How do they impact on how we listen to people, how we speak to people? So self-awareness to me is the hallmark of great communicators. It helps build empathy. It helps build their listening skills and their, their engagement skills. So those are, it's, it's not about you in relation to that one right now before we even get to that. Um, I like to to raise leaders' own self awareness, and that can be done relatively quickly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just giving them different ways to frame ideas, I think, is um, extremely useful. If you could go back in time to the start of your career, what is one piece of advice that you might give to young Clive? <laughs> oh gosh. How long have we got, Mary? <laughs> so I'm, I'm not one of those people, Mary. You know, <laughs> one, yeah, just, just they're one. They're often asked, you know, do you have any regrets? And people often say, no, because, you know, if I'd done things differently, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. I've got loads of regrets. <laughs> I, think I, did all the, I think I did all the dumb things. I, I would actually say um, back myself um, because I, for a time there, I just did kind of what everybody else thought. I should do. I followed a trajectory that seemed to be the one that most people take. Um, I often had the idea of, um, you know, I had my own ideas and I, you know, I felt like I wanted to share them and things like that. But I, I put constraints on myself because I believe that's what people do. Now, a lot of people do. A lot of this goes back to, again, the masks that I grew up with and my constraints that I developed around myself. So, yeah, I'd like to go back and say, you know what, back yourself. It'll work out. How can our listeners learn more about the topic? So obviously by reading your book. Oh, obviously. No. <laughs> but are there are there other resources? And we'll <laughs> we'll we will link that in the in the show notes, but are there other resources that you think that are out there that might be useful to look up for listeners? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let me just, there's so many, I'm a big reader. I love reading. I often think for the sake of a few bucks, I can get a person's entire wisdom. So I read a lot. So look off the top of my head, which will therefore probably be more current. Um, Sam Goodman, the hop nerd, um, his new book is called 10 ways to make safety suck less. I love the title. Um, recommend any of Sam's book, uh, Todd Conklin. If, if people in the safety field have not read Todd Conklin, um, off the top of my head, uh, the, is classic, the five principles of human performance. I recommend to pre accident investigation as a book, but also a podcast that Todd Conklin runs. So they'd be classics. Um, for people who get caught up in KPIs in safety, and you know, I've got a bit of a challenge with that, Mary. Um, and all of the paperwork stuff. Thoroughly recommend a book called Paper Safe by Greg Smith. He's actually a lawyer, but it's one of the best books I've read on the whole notion of paperwork, KPIs, policies, procedures, and safety. I'd recommend that. Oh, could, I cannot go past Amy Edmondson's book, The Fearless Organization. I think many of your listeners probably already read that. Can't really go past that. Um, other people like David Proven, um, Sidney Decker. All of those people have, have great books and great reading out there. There's just a few. <laughs> All right. Well, you've you've got your homework, listeners. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot There's to a read. Lot. Where can our listeners, uh, where where can they find you on the web should they wish to be? Sure. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn a lot. As many people would know, perhaps annoyingly so, I do post regularly on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect. I love chatting on LinkedIn. There's a whole I, – I learn a lot from LinkedIn. There's some really great people who post frequently and great articles. Um, our website – for, the, for our company is um, GIST Consulting, G-Y-S-T, GISTConsulting.com.au. Uh, there's a reading list on that, by the way, suggested reading list. Um, you can get in touch with us that way too. Oh, great. Well, that that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to our listeners for tuning in. And thanks so much for talking to us about your book and, and for the book itself. My pleasure, Mary. You got me, uh, you got me really motivated to talk there. So thank you. <laughs> that's great. 
Um, my thanks to the Safety Labs team, Safety Labs by Slice team. And don't forget to leave a review and share this podcast with someone you think might enjoy our discussions. Bye for now. Safety Labs is created by Slice, the only safety knife on the market with a finger-friendly blade. Find us at sliceproducts.com. Until next time, stay safe. Yeah.